So we're uh, getting into the home straight, um, and I hope that your energy is going to uh, keep up for the next uh, few hours, because we're really trying now to pull together all of the points uh, that we have been discussing over the past few days and getting them into, uh, you know, chewing them over a little bit more and having a chance uh, to think about them. When I was looking at this panel uh, after, after this morning's uh, session, uh, I really had the feeling that we were doing sort of part two of this morning's session uh, here because uh, I think that three very, very important points came out of that uh, discussion. And di points that uh, don't necessarily stick together, that need a little bit more discussion. And uh, I would like us to be able to, to chew over that a little bit more in this session. So those points are uh, from Guido, uh, the point that there is not always a clear business benefit uh, to ethical corporate behavior, not always a win-win, and seeing it in that way uh, leads to, to some mis-expectations. Um, the second one is that, uh, from the Edelman survey, that trust is really at an all-time low for business, or maybe not as much as in the Middle Ages or whatever we were discovering, but it's, at a very, it's very, very low. Uh, there really does need to be an effort on the part of, of companies uh, to regain that trust. And the third point, which I really liked coming out of the discussion, uh, was the point about the, the role of the person who brings the, the, the uh, business to uh, an ethical standpoint. How can I be ethical and still succeed in business, looking at it that way? Um, so with those three points, which, which point to all sorts of different motivations and mixed problems around how you embed uh, corporate social responsibility into a, a mainstream corporate strategy. Um, I would like us to uh, discuss that, and we have a great panel to do this. Let me just say, I see three uh, factors that, that are motivations in, that have moved companies towards uh, a greater uh, discussion over, over CSR and, uh, and trying to embed it in their strategies. And these sometimes come together, and sometimes are, are separate. And uh, I, I just want to throw them into the discussion before we then start looking at how companies are, are doing this. The first one is uh, a bit of a fear factor. Um, so it's how do we keep the license to operate? How do we regain trust? How do we avoid reputational damage? I think that's been a fairly big uh, part of, of getting companies uh, onto the, the bandwagon. And the standards for that, of course, shift. And if there's one, one issue that I was very surprised has not been raised in the whole of the two days, you know, we've talked about human rights, we've talked about child labor and you know, damaging products and all these things. We haven't talked about uh, tax avoidance. And uh, I'm not saying that because we're in Switzerland, as somebody said to me when I brought it up before. Um, it is a huge discussion in the UK, major discussion. The OECD has just been discussing it. Artificial tax avoidance by companies is that ethical behavior? Is that responsible corporate citizenship? I don't know. One of the things to discuss. So uh, the second uh, motivational factor, um, and this is one that I think makes it easier to bring it into the center of corporate strategy, is what do we need to do in our supply ch chain, our workforce, or our wider community to make sure that the risks to long-term business are lower? You know, that we reduce those risks. This is what Unilever is doing, for example, with uh, tea farmers in uh, Kenya, working with them on making sure that they don't destroy the quality of the soil so that they have a long-term business. Or we heard from uh, Firmenich, uh, looking at the farmers in, in Haiti. Uh, it's also uh, what Heineken was talking about with the workforce, Patagonia with the, the, the products that last a long time. And the third one is how do we stay attractive to employees, our potential employees or our existing employees, um, engaging them and, and so on. So these are all different ways that companies can get into the corporate social responsibility and then the journey starts from there, what it means, where it goes along. And what we're trying to discuss this afternoon is how you get this mindset really embedded into the company so it's not just identified with one person and if that person leaves, it's gone. Um, and that it also survives budget cuts. The, the title of this is In Tough Times. We are in tough times. We're probably going to be in tough times quite a long time. How can you make sure that it's really, there's really buy-in all the way down the company? 
And then we're going to look at the sort of tools that are around to help companies with corporate social responsibility from triple line reporting. This is really not a tool. I was trying to think of a better word, but I didn't come up with one. But things like, uh, you know, do we need more regulation? Is that something that would actually help companies in this field? Or are there controversial ways of uh, looking at it when you start to, to think about regulation? But I think one of the things we need to look at, moving it from a soft law, as you were saying, Christian, to a hard law environment. So those are the issues uh, coming in and the questions we'd like to discuss. Let me introduce uh, the panel to you and we'll get started on the discussion. And uh, we will bring you in to, to be uh, asking questions sort of halfway through the discussion. We're not going to wait till the end. Uh, so please start thinking about uh, getting active and asking questions early on. To my left, uh, Christian Leitz, uh, who is the head of corporate responsibility management at UBS. Um, to his left, Carl Friedrich Schäufler, co-president of Chopin. And then we have Bettina Ferdmann, who is the founder and CEO of the Phileas Foundation. And on the far left, Jan Notedem, senior advisor of CSI Europe. Christian, UBS, regaining trust. Big issue for you. We, you were showing me the uh, where do banks go on that, uh, on that uh, table of uh, trust a long way down. Um, how are you trying to embed CSR in your strategy? And what, what is the way in which you can persuade your, the, the board management to do that? So, thank you. Thank you for being here and uh, for inviting me. Um, we're in Switzerland, so I presume I don't need to introduce UBS. But hands up if there is anyone among you that has never heard of UBS. <coughs> So you have a reputation. That's a good start. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, we can talk about that later on. Um, uh, you know, 60,000, over 60,000 employees in over 50 countries, um, near enough 150 nationalities. And I'm not sort of, uh, I mean, numbers are important, as Robin said, but I actually put these numbers deliberately because if we do talk about employee engagement, we have to keep that in mind. You know, I mean, if you talk about employee engagement, then I think the question that we... One of the questions, one of the many questions is, of course, you know, a large company like that with that many nationalities, you know, engagement can be interpreted quite differently by different people and culture. Um, I'm glad that we're sort of towards the end. I mean, I'm not glad that we're towards the end of the event, but um, that we as a panel are towards the end because it always helps you to sort of, like you started off with, you know, draw some threads together. You can actually listen to other people. And like me getting depressed, you know, this morning first, uh, initially I got depressed, you know. I thought, you know, uh, was it Alexander Fink? He was very polite. I think he didn't mention banks. He just mentioned trust in general is a problem. Now, of course, when you look at the trust barometer, uh, we are second from the bottom. And the funny thing is, I don't know how Edelman does that, but financial services is at the bottom. So there's a <laughs> distinction between us, we're second, you know, and financial services. Uh, I'm sure Alexander is here. He can explain that. Uh, and then, of course, Guido, you know, he really got me depressed, you know, initially at least. You know. I mean, you know, as a CR practitioner of now 10 years, you know, I thought, okay, well, maybe I haven't really done anything over these years, and I'm exaggerating. Um, but those, putting those two things together, I thought, okay, that's a good start. You know. But then at the same time, I thought, you know, these events are here to be challenging, you know. I mean, if we're not challenging each other, then there's not much use. We're not sit, supposed to sit here and congratulate each other about the wonderful things that we do. And uh, if we do that, we shouldn't have these events, you know. So I think it was a really good thing to start off in, in that manner, you know, and actually challenge some of the things. And I do actually agree with some of the points that particularly Guido made, um, but then, you know, that's maybe something for later. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention um, is actually that I am also the, the uh, UBS's historian, you know, so I wear these interesting two hats, and that's what actually was, uh, was what I was hired for all these over 10 years ago. I was hired as UBS's historian, you know, so at the one hand, I am the company's historian. That's my trade, you know, I mean, I was a historian at university, I was a, you know, professor of history, um, and if there is ever a wicked problem, you know, that's the one that I dealt with in all my research and teaching, the Second World War, so I do know quite a bit about wicked problems, you know. Um, I think history does help you a lot with understanding, you know, the things that we're talking about. You know, I, I, that's one of the key problems that I see nowadays, there isn't enough history. And I think the, 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 the speed, and we talked a lot about information, the speed that we deal with, you know, in, in internet and so on, helps us, in a negative sense, to lose that sense of history. And I think we need 
to remind ourselves. So I've got this privilege, in a sense, in my role to be able to look furthest into the past at our company. You know, we are now, in a few days, will be 151 years. So last year we celebrated 150 years of history. And uh, just one anecdote on that. One of the starting points of Bank in Winterthur, for those of you who haven't read the history of our bank, uh, was actually the attempt of the city of Winterthur to build a railway to Geneva, bypassing Zurich. Because, of course, Winterthur had the aspiration to be the number one industrial city of Switzerland. Didn't quite work out. I think they nearly went bankrupt over it. But the bank, of course, stayed, you know, Bank in Winterthur, and eventually became the Union Bank of Switzerland, and, of course, on the other side in Basel, the Swiss Bank Corporation. So there's a rich history. There's a richness of experiences. Um, why I, I always emphasize history, not just because it's my passion, but I think if you want to understand such issues as strategy and the development of this topic that we're talking about, and whatever we call it, we've never called it CSR. We talked about this this morning. I don't like the term CSR, but that's a different discussion. At our company, we call it corporate responsibility. There are lots of terms going around, and I'm sure we can have a discussion about terminology, but that's not the key of this. But when you look at it, um, then you know one simple way into the question of strategy and embedding it is actually look at you know a company like ours because it was the one that I know most about and just to give you some examples I mean 1999 we certified the whole company uh, along uh, ISO 14001 the first bank to do that globally and I think the important thing is because that's maybe easily misunderstood for those who, are, who do know ISO 14001 we are probably also one of the few banks that do that across in-house activities, risk management, and products and services. Because ISO 14001 is usually associated more with the in-house environmental performance. We actually do it across. And I think that is crucial, because I work for a bank. So of course, when you talk about the topics that we talk about at this event, then most of the topics, to be quite frank, sit with the clients. They don't sit with us. So the discussion is really one between us and the client, rather than between us as a single company. Uh, we were the f one among the first signatories of the Global Compact in 2000. We were a founding member of the Wolfsburg Group, and, I th and don't forget, combating financial crime is a major topic around corporate responsibility in 1999-2000. Um, Wolfsburg is one, one of our two conference centers here in Switzerland. And then you continue. I mean, a critical point here, 2001, UBS put in place the Corporate Responsibility Committee which is a board of directors committee, one of our five board of directors committees. I'm the secretary to that committee. It's chaired by Axel Weber, our chairman. Uh, and that's where a lot of these discussions take place. And I think it takes us to one of the elements in the discussion that is the, the involvement or not, the role or not of senior management, you know, and the importance of that in the whole context of the discussion. Then you can continue 2006, statement on human rights, 2006, uh, climate change strategy, you know, so that's what we call it which we completed successfully at the end of 2012. We're the number one bank in the carbon disclosure project, so we do quite a bit around that space. 2008, uh, responsible supply chain standard and guideline, and I think that's also easily forgotten. A bank like UBS, I mean, last year, we bought nearly 7 billion francs worth of products and services. I think people don't associate supply chain with banks, but I think we do, and that's why we make sure that it's in the clauses with our you know, relevant contractors. Um, 2010, and just two more examples, 2010, position on controversial activities, that's risk management, where we make sure that our transactions, particularly in, well, actually among with clients and suppliers, uh, that there are particular topics that are being checked, you know, such as deforestation, you know, palm, palm oil issues, child labor, indigenous populations. So these kind of topics are part of the risk management discussion apart, apart from the, screen, the screening process that we do across uh, the bank. Uh, and we use international standards, so that gets us into the discussion about norms and standards, soft law, policies, hard law, you know, RSPO, FSC, Ramsar, CITES. So we very strongly depend on the fact that there are international standards because you have to, if you have a discussion with your management, you have to explain to them, so what are we pitching against? What are the sort of What's the kind of norm that is relevant? Because you know? otherwise the discussion is very difficult and the language, the, 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 the landscape of labels is massive enough as it is. So I think you know, trying to find a way through that. And the last one, which I think is crucial, and that takes us to a core part 
of the discussion that we should have, and that is actually business, is uh, introduction of uh, what we call values-based investing in 2009, which is uh, a part of our wealth management. And really, the idea of how do you actually relate business to the values of the client, in this case, wealth management. So we can talk about that more. But I think if you look at those, and I'll just put these, as I said, sort of from a historical perspective, if you put these in a row, you can see there are a lot of commitments inside the company. There are a lot of employees that are engaged in topics. They may not be engaged in the overall scheme of things, but they're engaged in parts of it. Uh, there is, of course, an important senior management commitment. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these things in place. You know, there are uh, structures and processes, and people often regard that as rather dull, but I think you know, that's how companies often work. There are structures and processes that are there and that must be there for this to actually work. So we get very quickly to day-to-day -day operations, and strategy, the kind of key points of the discussion. Can I just ask you, 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 know, you can see from all of these things that it's clearly uh, a lot of guidelines are embedded in a way that it would be very difficult for the bank, for anybody to reverse now because there are standards in place. But when you talk to uh, senior management or the board or indeed employees as, as a whole, how do you explain the overall direction of what you're trying to achieve with those individual things, because individually, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of grasp as a whole. How do you put it into a context of what you're trying to achieve? And I think, you know, there are, you can start off with, I mean, not starting off with in, in the hierarchy of importance, but one, one act, part of it is, of course, how do you actually report or communicate about these things generally? I mean, we've used the Global Reporting Initiative, which uh, I think Robin eventually found this in his brochure, you know, the Global Reporting Initiative. We've used that one to do our um, auditing, and we have it externally audited since our reporting year 2008. You know, so we do have a lot of numbers, you know, uh, because KPI seems to be a key bit of this. So in a sense, I mean, that, that one, answer, one answer of a number is, of course, you do, as Robin quite rightly said, you do have to give people information. It doesn't all have to be quantitative, but it certainly helps, you know, if it's quantitative. You know, some of it will hopefully never be quanti uh, you know, quantitative, you know, some of it should stay quanti qualitative, but I think it certainly helps if they're actually measurable, they're measurable information. I think the other thing is you have to put it into a larger picture, you know, and from all that I said, and of course, you know, um, I'm not deliberately ignoring the last six years and what we saw in the last six years. I had actually pre prepared a presentation which I didn't use, with, uh, uh, which relates to, to a cartoon around the sort of whole crisis that we had in 2008 and 2009. I think the starting point is really what I would call economic and financial sustainability, before we even talk about anything else. You know? And I think that's the starting point to the discussion. When you look at the, the things that I described, then the, the next step is how do all of these re things relate to the basic function of the company? How do they support it? You know, how do they actually help to advance that? This could be through the importance of stakeholder management, stakeholder discussions, stakeholder dialogue. It could be through how to engage employees. So I think the discussion, in contrast to what I outlined earlier on, does happen in a more holistic fashion because, of course, these parts you know, need to be part of something, otherwise they don't make, make much sense. They need to relate to the overall approach that you take. Uh, and I think that's how you normally get to get people who don't necessarily have an affinity to the topic to understand how it fits into it. I mean, I think you're completely lost if you just go there and say, okay, let's just do this for the sake of doing it. You know, I think there needs to be a relationship to something that makes sense to a person that may not have the background knowledge that we have, you know, as practitioners of that. And I think we always need to remind ourselves of that. I think over the years I've become more and more of a realist, you know. I'm neither an optimist, although I tend to be more optimistic, you know, nor a pessimist, you know. I think it's, you have to have a good sense of realism to be able to, to have those conversations. And it just... One last question, Duran. The, the point that, that uh, Guido raised this morning about the lack of causal uh, benefits or business benefit. How, how do you view that? Do you see these initiatives as having uh, a business benefit that you can measure, or do you see them as being important in this broader context? I've, I've just come back from a, an event where somebody, you know, on on a panel actually had. Um, 
praised his chocolate for quite obvious reasons because the chocolate was, was, was truly praiseworthy you know? and it's very sort of you know organic and environmentally sound and so on and he did this wonderful play on you know he gave everybody a piece of chocolate and sort of, you know the smell of chocolate the taste of chocolate you can associate to that well you try to do that with money you know it's a bit more difficult you know <laughs> the, the smell of money the taste of money I don't know that sounds pretty awful to me. But I think one thing that is very obvious, you know, which, which I think did come out of today's discussion, if there is one industry where trust and reputation is critical, then it's definitely ours. You know. I mean, banking, particularly with a bank like ours that has an enormous stake in wealth management, you know, so with the private client side. But even on the corporate, I mean, you know, I'm, not, I'm not playing down the corporate side, but you know, on the individual level, on, on, the, on the corporate level, this is an immense factor. You know, and I think if, and, and of course, you know, we've learned that to our detriment uh, during 2008, though, although I always have to distinguish, uh, and I think that needs to be f remembered when you look at reputation, reputation is not normally global, it's rarely global. You know, there are, dis you know, when we look at our reputation measurement, there are clear distinctions between one region and the other. You know, so clearly when people, as we are, are in Switzerland, they do get maybe a different view of UBS than people do have in Asia. You know? So I think we need to, to take that distinction. But fundamentally, uh, you, know, you can put it into numbers in the sense of uh, there is business around the whole area of, let's say, values-based investing. You know, we have a new clean infrastructure energy fund, a very innovative thing in Switzerland, so that relates to the, to the government policy of, of changing the energy landscape. So there are these things, which are more on the products and services side. Fundamentally, these, all of these topics, in one way or another, relate back to trust and reputation and among your employees, but of course, you know, so when I say the core stakeholders, clients, employees, investors. Okay, I'm sure we'll return to that uh, in the broader discussion. Thank you very much. And Carl Friedrich, can I move on to you to ask the same question? How have you, I mean, gold is a little bit easier to uh, <laughs> taste and smell, I think, you know, <laughs> or not, maybe not. Um, how do you uh, position CSR within your company? How do you see it and how do you ensure that it's embedded? Well, first of all, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with our company. And uh, I think it's maybe good to situate us as, uh, as we come from a completely different, different sector with the luxury industry. And um, we're one of the last family-owned companies in, in that field. Um, Chopin is uh, a company which uh, was founded in 1860 and for the last uh, 50 or so years my uh, family uh, accompanied the company. My father bought it in 1963. And today we, we have almost 2,000 employees. And um, over the last 15 years we, we grew extensively. We run this company as a family. My sister is involved. I'm personally involved, of course. And um, we were leading up to our um, to celebrating the 150th anniversary of uh, Chopin, 2010. And um, we, were, we were considering what would be very most meaningful to do in terms of celebrating this anniversary. Um, the idea came to our mind and we, we discussed it at length in the family is that we, we now have a certain size of company where we need to define our values. We need to officialize these values, which we, by which we, we of course uh, led the company over the years, but uh, it was not written down. And also at the same time, we first came across uh, the corporate responsibility of having to be part of our values. They were in fact, because that's what we found out when we, when we did our audit, of course, but uh, they were not really uh, embedded in the everyday activities sometimes. And uh, we actually uh, designed a, a collection of uh, 
jewelry items called Animal World. And um, there was kind of a natural uh, affinity to WWF. We decided that we wanted to be become uh, a part of WWF. And I did speak personally to, to their management in Glan at the time and found out that, in fact, uh, you really have to be qualified to be a partner of this uh, organization. And this uh, led us to, um, to really reconsider and to really audit our, our company and our ways of doing things. And we, we defined the governing principles of um, our organization throughout uh, all the way to 11, our 11 subsidiaries. We, in fact, uh, work in 11 countries with subsidiary offices. We have a very much integrated production process. We produce almost, I would say, 80% of um, the components for our products in-house in Switzerland. We are truly uh, uh, Swiss made, so to speak. But we also have a number of suppliers, of course, and uh, I was uh, laughing a little bit just before when, when Robin mentioned uh, the box. <laughs> and um, in fact, in our case, the box also uh, is not made in Switzerland, or not all of them are made in Switzerland, and some are made in Thailand or China. So. We, we also came across uh, an organization called the Responsible Jewelry Council. And um, we decided that we wanted to adhere to, to their principles. And um, we, de we decided to, uh, to go through the uh, whole process of um, making us uh, a full member of this organization, which counts, by the way, Today, 400 uh, jewelry and watch firms already within a very short period of time, 10 years. Um, when we embarked on this uh, program within our company, we, we quickly realized that, in fact, we, were, we had a lot of homework to do inside, but also looking at our suppliers and looking at our clients. And um, it was very important at that stage that uh, the family, and in particular myself, uh, became involved personally. We realized that uh, we, there were changes to be, to be operated, changes uh, in behavior, in, in, in different uh, activities, and it was really necessary to endorse these. Um, and also to, to make sure that our employees, who, who actually were e extremely enthusiastic about the project, um, wanted to, to pull along. And um, in fact, I, I personally followed uh, the process, uh, also because uh, my personal assistant, who accompanied today, uh, Mrs. Kulilas, is, um, was more and more involved and today is actually uh, running this project, which in fact you can't call it a project anymore. It is really, uh, has become uh, part of our corporate life and uh, we consistently uh, worked in, in all different departments in the production we have by the way, 30 different, uh, 30 different crafts that we exercise within our company. Um, so all the way from the production side to the uh, satellites around the world. We, we very much, um, um, we, we think it's very important in our field also to, um, to keep these crafts alive the heritage of uh, what makes uh, Swiss watch industry, of course, but also um, we very much in, are involved in um, 
training young people. We have a very big training program run uh, since many years. We have almost about 40 young people being trained at all times in different professions. Um, and recently we embarked on uh, yet another project which uh, is, is most important to, to us because it's particular to our industry. As we found that it was very easy at the end to trace um, the few products that we bought. One of the key uh, products, that, well, not products as such, but um, um, elements that we bought was, of course, gold and precious stones. And um, the general public, uh, over the years, has become more and more aware of, obviously, of the importance of tracing back these materials all the way to the mine, in that case. And we, we were wondering, isn't it possible to, to produce at least a small collection of jewelry uh, where we, we control every single step? And uh, by, um, by means of associating ourselves with a, a small mine in Colombia, we, uh, we realized we, we, we um, actually managed uh, this challenge, and just recently, as we are also a sponsor of the Cannes Film Festival, we we presented this uh, this piece of jewelry there, um, and we called the project the Green Carpet. Um, we thought it is a very be befitting place to communicate about the the project because we had a maximum visibility. And I think as a, as a luxury goods company, we have that unique uh, possibility to, to use our visibility to communicate values. And uh, so this uh, green carpet project was very well received. But obviously, so far, I admit it's only a a very small portion of what we, we produce annually, but it will, it will help us along the journey towards uh, a better corporate social responsibility, which is really what we want to achieve. And um, I must admit, uh, it was a very, it was a wonderful experience. Now, looking back uh, the last five years, since we started um, launching these different uh, activities in our company. And um, I know that we are far away, and talking about being depressed, we are very far away from um, um, the presentation we, we just saw from uh, Robin. But um, I guess if you don't start, you'll never get anywhere. And uh, I think uh, it's very important to, to get started. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> that in itself is a very important sentiment. And I think something that is, uh, from, from the whole two days, there's been quite a lot of uh, talk of the vulnerability of companies as they move into these spheres. And I think now of you know, Coca-Cola and its move into uh, tackling obesity, it does actually require courage to stand up and even say that kind of thing because it opens you up to a lot of, uh, of uh, room for attack. Um, I'd like to uh, throw the floor open to you for some questions around this, actually. Um, as, is there anybody who has uh, questions immediately? While, while you're thinking about your questions, I just want to ask you uh, to... I, I understand from the journey that you have made and where it came from in, based in values. But when you're talking about it within the company, how do you relate it to your business success or future? Is it, is it a, something that is completely parallel and separate from talking about the business? Or is it something that you look at as having business consequences in a long-term way? Well, I think uh, looking at... Uh Looking at, uh, just looking at um, our youngest daughter, for example. 
she's 12, and she, her, in her school, she had a project about child labor. And she went to interview uh, someone. They were a small group, and they were supposed to do a presentation about this. Um, just looking around uh, today, the, the questions of transparency, the questions of how, how is the product that I'm buying, is, how is it made, who makes it, where does it come from, um, who produces it. These questions are uh, more and more and more frequent and I think for a, a company that produces products that nobody really needs, which is watches and jewelry, uh, we're supposed to make people dream, and uh, we're, we're basically selling a dream. Um, the dream has to be intact, and therefore, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, people enjoy every moment of, uh, of wearing the product they bought. And I think uh, going forward, this is... Uh, a very obvious uh, necessity. So how do we communicate it? We, we communicate it to our employees in, in just that way. It, is, it has to become part of our production process, of our selling process, of our way of doing, doing things. Thank you. Interesting. Questions from the audience? Please, Rachel. I have a question, Marcello Palazzi, Progress Foundation in the Netherlands. I have a question for Christian. Uh, in your work as a historian, have you found uh, moments where UBS had real questions about whether size was of ultimate importance? And I ask this question in general, not about UBS. I think that one of the issues we face, we heard it earlier, is that there is a sort of disconnection between the social contract and the corporation. And in a way, the bigger the company is, the more global, the more difficult it is to hold onto the social contract. So the question is, has this ever been an issue? Should we grow, should we not grow? Should we stay small or, or smaller? Just, just of interest uh, to find out. Well, I, I think you, know, you, you sort of um, see more often than not in, in all that I've seen, you know, is that it actually happens, you know, more than it actually be sort of um, Guided. I mean, if you go back, you know, Union Bank of Switzerland uh, is, is, is a merger of two smaller banks, you know. Well, then it becomes a larger bank. You know? I mean, when I look at our history, there are more than 370 institutions part of our history uh, across the globe. I mean, you know, so in a sense, uh, maybe there is occasional thinking about this, but I think often it really happens for particular reasons. I mean, I give you a, an example. I, I think there is an issue also, a discussion around the business model. When you look at the origins of, of, of our bank in Switzerland, then of course, you know, this was largely to finance, you know, the industrialization of the country, you know, to make Switzerland what it is today, you know, railways, electrification, and so on, you know. So this is clearly for most of the history, it was they were commercial banks. That's what they were involved in, you know. So there was a conscious, conscious decision, for instance, in the, which I think people don't realize, you know, until they look at that more closely, to move, for instance, into retail banking in the 1950s. That wasn't part of the sort of business model of UBS. You know? And then suddenly you see massive growth in the 1960s you know, with you know, banks being bought up around Switzerland, branches being opened, you know, and we, we suddenly have also a lot of innovation around that. Um, so I think there are sort of moments where you, could, where you could argue, okay, there is a particular point in time where, they, where one thinks about, okay, where is our business model going? You, know? uh, you could go to the 1990s as another example. There was a lot of thinking and of course some banks went that way, uh, I suppose ours, thankfully not, uh, is to go for the, the old finance model. You know, and you have insurance as part of the bank, or the insurance and the bank together, you know, which uh, I presume, I would say, didn't work out too well for most of these models. You know. um, there is also, I think, which, which is I always, I mean, my point about, being, about history being important, it reminds us, usually, that's why I'm not too often impressed about consultants, because I find that uh, ideas have been around, you know. I think I'm impressed about them when they're good at recycling what's been around, you know, clever at putting it together in a new form. Uh, a lot of innovation, you know, is actually people being very clever about doing what's already around, you know, and putting it maybe in a new form and advancing its shape. Um, 
But um, it was interesting to see when, 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 when the first so-called marketing <coughs> research was done. You know, remember, at, at, at banks in Switzerland, I know it for, as I'm, I'm sure it's, it's the case for other banks, but I know it for definite at our bank. I mean, uh, until the early 1970s, the, the departments responsible for this were called propaganda departments, you know, just for use outside Switzerland. That's an interesting one uh, to observe. But out of that, you know, you had these discussions. The first discussions around public relations, around marketing, you know, whatever the terms are today, you know. Uh, and they did a study, you know, marketing research study. And the, and the funny thing is, when you look at some of these lines, then you could say, what's the difference then and today? Because what they observed is, we are not really loved by the people. You know, it's not, we're a large bank. That automatically makes us not something that is, in a sense, creates this emotional factor necessarily. But as long as we do our business right, you know, then that's okay, we can live with that. You know? But don't expect, as a large company, to get all the sort of hard sympathy from people. They will have that much more with smaller institutions. You'll have to live with that reality. You know? I think that's an important aspect. If you, are, if you are reaching that point where you regard it as large, and that's a definition, that's a question in itself. I mean, I, the term SME, in my mind, includes the likes of Geberit and others. I mean, they're pretty large, you know, but they still fall under the heading of SME. What makes a company large is a question in itself. But I think that kind of observation of what does it actually mean in your relationship with people? That's, that's, an, that's to me, an interesting one. Yeah. Thank, you. So. Thank you for being here, Christian. Because uh, So if you're here, I might ask you <laughs> some dif difficult question. Um, <laughs> she, she started off with tax <laughs> you know. <laughs> And the question is about, hasn't been answered yet. So. Uh, and, and it's not to you personally, but it's obviously how does management and the board feel about the fact that you have a lot of norms and standards, which you mentioned, ISO certifications, global compact. And even though you have all these standards in your company, this does not avoid, uh, in my opinion, unacceptable behavior and deviance, if you talk about the LIBOR rate or all sorts of things that happened in the last few, few years which, which came out in the public. Now, so my question is, how does the board and how does management feel about this and what, what can be done to, because, because having all these standards did not avoid this. So there must be another answer to explain or at least to correct this type of deviance, uh, or this type of unacceptable behavior in, 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 in the future. So that's one question for you, and then I have one very short one for Karl Friedrich. You embarked in this journey, like you said. What was, very shortly, the major difficulties that you had to implement this in your company? You know, what, is it a question of uh, changing the organization, or resources, or changing the minds and hearts, which is one of our Slogans here. This is a, this is a question. Thank you. Should okay. Let's start I mean, with the easy one. Mine, <laughs> mine is the easy one. <laughs> Your easy one. Your Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, the easy answer is it's not acceptable. You know, I mean, you know, that's the very simple answer. It's not acceptable. I mean, if you ask our senior management, then clearly it is not acceptable. You know, I mean, that doesn't take it away. I mean, that's of course what your question is all about. I mean, ultimately, of course, as we all know, norms and stand, I mean, I, I drafted the first version of our new code of business conduct and ethics in 2009-10, you know, when it, and it actually, it's an interesting document to read because codes of conduct, you know, it's actually interesting how rarely people read documents of companies. You know, I mean, Robin held up this thing, you know, he didn't ask how many of us had actually even known that they do this thing, you know. And then we talk about quarterly reports all the time. I mean, I would like to see how many people actually read it, other than analysts, of course, that have, they have to read it. You know. We had this short <coughs> conversation early on. Uh, as a historian that has a different research mind, you know, I, I look at these reports, I think there's a lot of, these, they're like gold mines. But people don't use them as gold mines, you know, because they reflect a lot. I mean, read a shareholder's letter. Take 10 years of shareholder's letters of a company. I mean, ours, for instance, the first thing that you'd notice is they, nowadays, they almost consistently use the word stakeholder. And, they, and it's the shareholder's letter, you know. And 10 years ago, you would have probably not seen that word too often. Now, again, it's semantics, maybe. But I think it's also, there is more that you can t take out of these 
reports when you look at them carefully. But ultimately, they're documents. Any norm, any standard is a document. It's got to be implemented. I mean, that's why I like what I like about management systems. Although I'm not, I'm, I'm you know, I don't come from that field. You know, something like ISO 14001 is that it really disciplines people. You know, that does help. I mean, it's not the, the whole answer, but it certainly helps. But ultimately, they are documents. They have to be, it's a very complex process to get them into, a, to use that expression, the minds and hearts of people. Minds is probably easier, hearts. Maybe, maybe you don't always need them to get them into the hearts of people. As long as they're in the mind, maybe that already helps, you know. Um, but it is an immense process, you know. And the other thing is what we should also not forget is that, and that goes back to the earlier question about large companies. You know, any large institution, but also smaller ones, but we notice it more about large ones, there will always be mistakes. There will always be problems. I mean, you know, that's why I, I look at this as a historian, that's why I'm saying I'm a realist. You know, there will always be crises. It's not avoidable. The question is what kind of size these problems, crises, and, 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 and so on. <coughs> that's why, again, read annual reports. Read the notes at the end for the last 10 years, and you'll find, because people have, I mean, if you're listed, you have to report about litigation cases and so on. You know. The ones that stick out are the large ones, but companies constantly have issues. It's just from which point onwards does it have a different level of impact, and how do you tackle that one? And you know, then we come back to the first point, it's not acceptable, but it takes a pretty lot of work you know, to make sure that everybody understands uh, how they should behave, you know, that takes us into another discussion. Just before we move on, I'm sorry to push you one more time, I'm, <laughs> I'm avoiding text, don't worry, I'm not talking about that. Um, do you think that you've got, or is it part of the job of the corporate responsibility person to be putting standards in place that would avoid these kind of problems, or is that something that goes beyond, do, do you, and do you feel that you're putting those things in place now? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I have a very small team, you know. If, I, if that was my, I mean, I, you know, it's me plus two other people, and there are 60,000 other ones out there, so you don't expect mm. wonders, you know, or miracles, you know. Um, but, you know, essentially, I think I see myself more as um, the sort of, somebody once called it the sort of internal NGO, and in talking about this, you know, is actually in the sense, in the positive, and again, that's a, that's a comment that came up earlier on, you know, in the constructive sense, just make people aware of what are actually the issues and the developments and the trends and so on out there. That's the task of our, that's one of the key tasks of our corporate responsibility committee. It is to really say, okay, we are, you know, what are the developments and how do, you, do, we, deal, do, we, do we deal with that? And of course, then there are people who can develop norms and standards around that. That's not necessarily my job. But the starting point is, you know, 13 years ago, my predecessor raised the topic of human rights to senior management. And the reaction was, what's that got to do with banks? And yeah, the reaction was an understandable one. It, it didn't seem to have anything to do with banks. You know? That's absolutely impossible today. You know? We have an initiative with other banks. You know, we work on this. We look at this. We, 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 we develop what it means for due diligence. Uh, but you have to have a starting point to get that discussion going that actually gets you, gets people to think about, oh, what do we need in place? You know? And don't forget, a lot of people do think in policies and processes. You know, so therefore, you need to find some standard, some norm, something that relates to the issue that you're raising. OK, just covering your points of the challenges that you had on where what did you have? Well, I think um, there were a number of challenges, of course. But uh, one first one was to, to make everyone uh, understand that this is uh, a priority or part of our priorities and it's not just another another job that has to be done or something that we have to tick off um, but it's it it is something to be taken seriously and also something that has to be understood as becoming part of our everyday live in, in the company. And um, that was the, the people-related problem, I would say. Or the, the, and so we, we really tried to, we did a lot of internal communication about it. And um, we um, did some 
internal advertising or uh, newsletters, and we try to involve uh, uh, everyone, whether it's in, in, in the workshop level or uh, at the administration level, to come up also with ideas. And actually, uh, some of the ideas were very interesting and then were adopted, and so people actually noticed that they could contribute to, um, to something bigger, something that was, uh, became all of a sudden more interesting to them, because not only a top-down approach were, um, you know, we, first thing we were told, of course, we have no resources, we need uh, to hire people, we need a budget, and so on and so forth. But then we noticed that we could actually do things with less budget um, if we got everyone involved. And uh, when it was not uh, just an additional workload which had to be uh, you know, evacuated in a way. So these were the main difficulties, really, that um, um, we managed to, to very much uh, uh, put aside over the within you know a two year period, and then uh, also the fact that we were uh, we became full member of this uh, responsible jury council and and people kind of started to share the excitement and uh, and, and they were proud that this was uh, that we managed to do that first step and so on. The important, I think the important thing now is to, to, keep, to keep the excitement going or to keep the enthusiasm going and, uh, and to make it, uh, yes, a heartfelt thing and not just um, you know, an additional administrative um, con contingent which uh, uh, nobody really, really wants, you know. Yeah. I know I saw your hand before, but I'm going to bring you in afterwards. I just need to let uh, Jan and uh, Bettina into the discussion, and then we will uh, open it out. Um, Jan, you've been uh, listening to this, and you're dealing with companies throughout Europe uh, who are trying to find ways to, to embed corporate strategy. How, what do you see as the, the main ways in which companies are able to, to do that? Or maybe it will be also interesting to see what are the examples where a company is not able to do that? What goes wrong when they've come up with some sort of big plan and then nothing happens and they sort of back down? <laughs> you can opt for either of those. I'll give you the easy way first. Mm. Um, well, yes, being since 20 years with Bettina and, and many others um, in this journey, I am tempted to say that we have been shaping a failure um, the only article I have ever written is a chronicle of a forecast dead. CSR is there to die. If it's, not like, if it's not a kind of OGM to help a kind of genetic modification of the organization, if it's becoming a department where CSR managers keep the agenda because it's so exciting, by the way. We've got a good example today of how exciting it can be, how difficult it is, but how exciting it is. If it's not there to die, by getting it, by let it go in the other departments. Your role is to be, I think, in a company, a double role, le fou du roi. You have a license to tell to your board and CEOs, guys, look at that and look at that. And you illustrated capturing the trends, the short, medium, and longer term trends, and be the fou du roi. It's not easy to be that in a company. But then for your colleagues, be a, not a pain, but be a, a stone in the shoe. It's a never-ended business. Um, but what could be terms of success or success elements of a good, responsible company using the CSR, or whatever we call it? Since it's a failure, I s still keep calling that corporate social or societal responsibility. But to make my life easier, I use it for, it's a common sense revolution. And I was <laughs> very much supported this morning to say, this is a revolution towards a corporate 
sapiens and not only a corporate demons that we witness. So you can play with these words, but this is something that helps me also in the morning to continue uh, for that unfinished job. But if you look carefully, especially through the crisis, those companies who have not decreased but increased CSR, who have upgraded that, are those companies who have board members and leaders that have a kind of statementship attitude, that have a capacity to think the purpose of the enterprise, to revisit it, and this together with a kind of common good sense. That's statementship. I take these words from Philippe de Vaud. Um, also getting, and I take it from Robin, I think, get the facts. Get the bloody facts. And try to improve measurement of quantity and quality. But facts is critical for decision making. Is it for the investors? Is it for your board? I take the example of another bank, no fame, no shame here today, but one that has really almost doubled its investment in CSR activities during the crisis is a bank that has been able to measure the return of employee community engagement that can be seen as a nice to have. No, no, that became extremely strategic because they were able to make a link between that activity with a financial or two financial drivers, which was brand reputation and the rise in numbers of clients locally in the banks. So that makes you think otherwise what um, can be CSR uh, activities. Another one is allow your employees and managers to be the social entrepreneurs they are somewhere. Especially with large companies, I've been working in public administrations, but bureaucracy and bureaucrats and depressed people in large companies is very, very common. It's not for nothing. In 2017, it will be the first number one disease in Europe, depression and negative stress. But you know, when you work for 10 years, and you do le grand écart between your values and not the values that are in a code or on a paper in the company, but the values that are lived in the company, well, you get really very demotivated. So how to find processes where there is a license for you to get the ideas of how they see it and don't restrict them just to their function. That is, I think, not a good success factor. And then stakeholders, I see those companies who are making stakeholders part of their R&D, and not just to have stakeholders because you can tick the box to say, I have been discussing with XYZ, but make them really strategic. That's the most impactful work we do with our corporate members. Stakeholder co-building solution sessions. It's amazing what expertise and innovation and entrepreneurial spirit there is with civil society organizations, policy administrations. The CEO of McCain, family business from Canada, French fries, number one in the world, told us in a session, I got two things from this session. You have sent me to Yunus to rethink my business models with regard to nutrition. And two, I got from the European Commission that we can say Brussels, Brussels, stupid people, but they say they have been acting as really innovators. We have ideas regarding changing some of our products thanks to their inputs in a stakeholder session that was prepared a year in advance and that goes after six months you have your, your sessions. So stakeholders see them as critical R&D. They can rethink the future of some of your services and products. And then, of course, equip the people. With, you can discuss gender, diversity, active aging. Human rights was mentioned. But we need modern tools to manage companies that can take that on board to look at the compliance aspect of it and the opportunity aspect of it. And last but not least, celebrate. I think today, here in Zermatt and at other events, 
we celebrate, and because we need that as human beings. But in companies, in times of crisis, and in this Europe of depression, if there would be a Nobel Prize of depression, Europe would win every year, I think. <laughs> so celebrating not only the joy, but also the tears, the blood and sweat of your men and women working with others to find solutions, and not the Nirvana solution, very step-by-step -step concrete solutions. So celebration, I think, is something that we maybe have lost, and I think this has a place in companies. Thank you very much. Bettina, let me bring you in to, uh, to comment on the same thing. What, what do you see as the, the big trends that in companies that are able to embed uh, CSR in there? in their strategy? So first of all, for 15 years, we, we disagree from time to time. So I, I do not believe in the common sense revolution. I just think that uh, responsible business is about common sense full stop. If you have a good product, good service, if you treat properly your employees, uh, if you know who your suppliers are, and if you engage in the community, then you are profitable. Uh, and if you are profitable, then you can hire more people and you can develop the marketplace. So that's a first thing. Second, uh, CSR is not yet embedded in companies. It very much depends on the sector, on the size, on the structure. Uh, and I have uh, observed a lot of progress, especially in large companies in the past years. A lot of progress because they were under the, uh, because they had uh, bad behavior or bad reputation, and this helped them to, to, to realize and to go and start to the, to the journey. Uh, but I really believe we are not there yet. And we are not there yet uh, because it's still very difficult inside the company um, to, to really convince each of the business unit that they have uh, something to do about it. So we are listening a lot about uh, social innovation, but for the moment, I really don't see. I mean, it's still very avant-gardiste that we can bring uh, the R&D uh, uh, department with uh, the CSR department and another one to, to really move. So I think we are still very much at, at the beginning. Um, so the implementation of whatever you call it, and we will call it C CSR, is still and will remain directly linked to the values, to the individual within the, the companies and the engagement and action. And what is most critical in an economic uh, turmoil is that what, would, what is the, the basic, and, and I'm sorry because I, I feel so, so basic talking to you now, but uh, it's how can companies just make their employees and especially line managers that they just think when they take a decision, what is going to be the impact of my decision for the company, for outside my clients, and so on and so forth. And we are in a situation now that because everyone is in this crisis, Obviously, there are sectors that are less, but still, where the employees, they, they just don't have the time to think and to breathe. And this is, in my opinion, a real problem when we, we start to, to talk about what is responsible uh, business, because it's really there where the problem is. And now, uh, it's not a of course, it is really important that you have a CEO that has a vision, um, that has value, uh, that has capacity in management, that put process and so on. But if at the line management they don't understand that, then there's nothing that is happening. And I think, uh, I don't want to sign too pessimistic, but I, I really do think that this is a real problem. And when we are talking about responsible business also 
uh, in tough time. Um, and Christian was saying, yes, we, we have to go back to the past and the history and so on. I think it's also responsible business is also about anticipation. And what we, what um, the top manager, of course they will need uh, to reorganize, to lay off, to, to, to close a production site and putting somewhere else. They have to do it, but the question is what did they do before so that the employees, they are going to find uh, a job? Uh, were they able to train them uh, prior so that when they have no more job, they can find another one or create one? And I think this question of employability uh, in, uh, in tough time is also very important because we see more and more that there is a big gap uh, uh, within the unemployment people and that there will be a range of employees that are today uh, in companies that when they will be outside, it will be very difficult for them to come back uh, on, the, on the marketplace. Now maybe to finish, I want to give you two very uh, positive examples that I like very much. And uh, some of the, because, uh, and, and one is, uh, Filias is very much uh, uh, involved in uh, employee engagement. And um, we have a, a program with, uh, with the group Manor, which is a, a big retail uh, company in, uh, in Switzerland. And uh, the objective was really to engage the employees of, uh, of the shop uh, in order for them to, to really uh, have a sense of what they do. And obviously, it's a, it's a sector where the wages are not that high, uh, where the conditions are quite difficult, and so on and so forth. And so we have identified a couple of issues where they, they could really be involved and, I, and be proud of what they were doing in the day-to-day -day business. And one of the, the, the projects is that the security person of the, of the shop, which is a, a shop of uh, 1,000 uh, uh, employees, so it's a very large shop, uh, Manor Genève, for those who, who know. Um, she takes every, every month uh, a group of young people completely outside of the marketplace and uh, of the school and she explains how the shop works and what is security about. And it's a partnership with an association which really help um, young people not to get into the violence and so on and so forth. And on this monthly ba basis, on one hand, you have one employee who really feel what security is about and, and how it, it can be uh, uh, explain and transfer, so she's very proud. And on the other hand, you have the NGOs and the young people where you see that you can prevent some of, of the way they, they, they do act. This is one example. Second example I, I would like to, to share with you uh, that we have developed for, for L'Oréal Switzerland where they, they had their 100th anniversary. They wanted to have projects where they give back to the community. And, uh, um, and we started to, to think about uh, where were the needs about especially uh, women um, and about this concept of je le vaux bien, hein, parce, que je, parce que je le vaux bien. Mm -hmm. And then we, we have identified some NGOs helping um, uh, disadvantaged women. And what they said to us was very clear, was before anything, to help them to integrate in, in, the, uh, in, in the social world or to find a new job, they have to have self-esteem. And how do you get self-esteem? So we, we set up some uh, self-esteem workshop where L'Oréal and employees from L'Oréal are coaching uh, these ladies about how to look. And then you have a, a photograph that take a picture so that they can see and it's about social aesthetic. It's not about just relooking. It's much more in depth. And then you have other uh, 
uh, employee, volunteering employees that uh, either depending on the, the profile of the lady uh, will make um, a simulation of interviews or they will just go uh, in a museum just to show them that yes, they can go in a museum as well. And um, again, this type of project, first of all, is linked to the core business, but it helps clearly to, to tackle a social local issues. You have voluntary uh, employees from all hierarchy of the company, and they are proud of it. And if there, there are um, difficulties within the companies, they still have something together that help them um, to continue the, the journey. So I wanted to finish with these two examples because I, I think they are, um, you can say it's micro, uh, we are now trying to replicate, but nevertheless it's concrete and it touches many different uh, individuals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bettina. Um, you wanted to make a comment, and then I'm going to uh, open it up again. I think just quickly, because we, um, you know, I think you know, we had the mention, I think, several times of the top of the term CSR department. You know, that in itself is an interesting mm -hmm. discussion, and we, we, you know, I think you just continued it with this discussion about micro and macro. I mean, I suppose you know what I talked about is more sort of at the macro level, and then it comes back to the question, you know, how do you actually do that? around a large company. But I think as far as strategy is concerned, it is an interesting discussion to, to sort of consider um, what's the real, what's the best model, if there is a best model for a company. Um, and of course, you know, there are companies that have a central department, you know, that's why this term CSR department comes up, and, and, and a lot of it is run out of that. I think often my impression is this happens when companies are at the beginning of the journey, because they need to start, you know, thinking about it. Ideally, of course, you know, you want to have it embedded where it should be embedded, you know, in those departments that actually are the experts, you know. And I think that's, that's my point, again, just coming back quickly to why I emphasized the different parts in this brief history that I gave and why I talked about policies and processes, because what it actually means, it's then embedded among those people that actually, you know, they might, they don't, they don't have any CSR background, they have a risk background, they have a whatever, in-house in in -house background, you know, looking at big arch the architecture and the, the windows and, and, and insulation and whatever. Or they have a background of developing products and services. You know. Or they have a background in compliance. Or you bring them, of course, together. I mean, our environmental social risk screening, you know, and I think we have a pretty advanced process there, is a, com is a cooperation between our compliance and our risk people. You know. So I think, you know, that's ultimately... Um, to me, the way to go, and uh, which takes us back to Jan's point, you know, at the end of the day, will it, it might not eventually, it will not eventually need, if it, all of this works out, then the term will disappear, or the department will disappear, or whatever, or maybe it's really only those people who do, then do the job that, that you outlined, which is just thinking ahead. You know, everybody else will do the operative work, you know, and then, of course, hopefully that will also mean that the whole question about how you engage employees will become less of an issue because they will in some way or another be engaged because it's part of their job. Uh, yeah, it's a journey. I mean, we call our strategy, whenever we were presented, we call it a, a strategy of continuous improvement. That's not an excuse. It really, that's what it is, you know. Absolutely. So we're doing ourselves out of a job uh, here. Oh, no, uh, you had a question. Do you still want to ask the question? You're okay. Um, over here. Thank you, Renat for South Pole Carbon. I have, I'd like to ask you a very open and honest question. Um, on the one side, we all know we discussed that CSR is more and more important, there is more tools available and so on and so forth. And we also all know that social media provides much more information to everybody. On the other side, we have a financial crisis and we also are aware that a lot of companies cut budget these days. And we also know that competition from China, from other emerging markets is becoming stronger. So my open question to you and other companies you know, compared to five years ago, is there more or less awareness uh, and, and actually an urge to, to do something on the CEO level or the top management level uh, than now? And what do you think is going to happen in five years from now? So five years in the past, five years now. Where are we, really? 
And uh, you know, oh, just open it honest. Because, uh, yeah. Thank you. That is a very, very good question. And uh, it will allow each of you to have a, a, a summary comment. But please, please do address that very openly. I think that's, a, you know, is it still moving forward? Or has the crisis actually meant that it's reducing? And where are we going? What, is the, your, what do you anticipate for five years' time? OK, ISO 26000, GRI, integral reporting, initiative by NASDAQ, BlackRock, to create universal stand, ESG standards for stock markets globally. It's going to come to dis the discussion at the end of this year, the World Federation of Stock Markets. The list continues. There is a massive, I mean, you know, just the latest thing was the Chinese government issuing guidelines for their companies operating abroad. You know. um, it's just, an, just another example, you know. There is, an, there is a massively evol evolving list of initiatives, which also means there is a massively involving, evolving discussion, including, of course, among the governments of emerging markets. You know? Now, that may not be, I, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I can't look into the future and see what comes out of that, but there is a lot of development that I hadn't seen five years ago, which involves a lot of stakeholders. Now, you can take two, uh, you know, answers, again, the optimistic or the pessimistic out of that. The one could be we have what we have currently, which is a massively you know, uh, a chaotic regulatory landscape. That could be one answer, and I don't know where that's going to help us, you know, because everybody is doing their own little bit. Or actually, which I believe in, something will emerge out of that, will actually advance the whole discussion to the next level. Thank you. I think uh, working with uh, a number of countries, in fact, uh, more than 45 countries, because our business model is uh, very much towards exports. I am, I'm absolutely in line with you, looking at uh, the requirements that are coming or that are being discussed, uh, mainly in a, what is today for us a very important business partner of China, but also other countries. I think there is a, a need, an increasing need, for corporate responsibility. And there's uh, despite of the um, despite of the difficulties that economic difficulties that we are facing, in particularly in Europe, I don't think there is much room for maneuver. I think uh, the necessity will grow, and 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 those companies which uh, which take it antis well anticipate this today. I think they will they will come out stronger um, in five years' time, and although it may be it may be costly, it may be difficult, or it may be uh, it may be um, a, bur a financial burden. So I see cutting budget quite a lot. Now I also see uh, that uh, the SMEs is going to be really also demanding on how to develop um, their corporate social responsibility strategy in the sense that, uh, because what uh, Christian was saying with this regulation and so on and so forth, then all the la large companies, they're going to put even more pressure on, on SMEs and suppliers and so on. So I think that in, in the coming years, there will certainly be a lot that will or will need to be done uh, for SMEs. On the other hand, it will be also um, important to see how you can uh, advise uh, SMEs, help them also in their reporting, but uh, in a cost-effective way, because uh, they don't have the same resources and they don't have the same uh, time, uh, and uh, we can question the CSR department, but for sure they don't have one, okay? So, uh, so I think that in the future, th this will be, at least in Europe, one important aspect. And obviously, as uh, we were talking about the supply chain and so on and so forth, clearly it will be out of Europe that it will be uh, the main, uh, the main uh, burden for, for companies. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes. No, I think all the indicators are showing that despite in some companies they are cutting budgets, I don't see that as a problem at all. Um, you can do even CSR even better with even 
still less budgets. Um, that's not the debate. Because the, if you do it right, the return on investment really uh, is, much, is, is much higher. Um, you are right, I think, telling that we see already Chinese companies asking their customers in Europe to come up with transparency on these issues. So I think that the B2B will be even much stronger and tougher than any regulation. On top of it, new regulation is coming up. Europe currently in the Council and the Parliament are discussing a transparency regulation on non-financial information, taking also the points, the conclusions of the heads of states three weeks ago was about, and let's see how we do that also with the agenda we have on tax and transparency on that. But uh, let's hope that it will be a smart regulation that is forcing companies through a complier explain to think in a more integrated way at board level their performance. Uh, reporting is a mean, it's not an end. Um, so I think all the indicators are showing that there is really a strong increase. Also, if you look at the boards of companies, there is an upgrade in terms of quality of who is in charge. The times of having the communication, the HR one, to have an extra uh, dot on his list of responsibilities, that is shifting. It's much more strategic. Um, and then last but not least, um, five years. I think we had debates all the day. What is going to be that new deal between business consumers and policymakers with regard always consuming more? Is it more have or more being? Eh? All these discussions we had this morning. That is all about, and it's the slogan of Europe today, Europe 2020, which we have on our initiative, which is called Enterprise 2020. It's a smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. What does it mean? But that is boiling in the heads of, of many, many. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question here. That's way. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, very inspiring. Uh, I have just a question about the cultural side. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Schäufele said, uh, yeah, we need to, we started with value. With values, it's very important. And somebody else said, we need to work on the management. I, I, I'm not sure it's Bettina, I thought. And I think it's very important to emphasize on the culture. And if we see how it's difficult, let's say just for example, uh, in Switzerland, how cultural shift is difficult. Let's speak about taxation. Uh, then I would like to know how have you succeeded in changing culture at the grassroots level, at the management, at the line management level, because they have others' uh, agendas. I agree with you. This is nice, and bright, it's great. And uh, supplier ask for it, and customer ask for it. And how can we do it at the grassroots level because the managers have other, line managers have often others, uh, other agendas. Thank you. Let me ask, you can uh, ask your question too, and then we need to wrap up because we have one more session after this. So quickly, uh, we'll do the two questions together. So I would ask without microphone, and this is not a question. I've been sitting on the board of ISO and the council of ISO for the last six years. So 20, uh, 2008 to 2013, um, and the thank you. Yes, it's working. It works. Um, the, during that period, uh, all standards have been easily asked, heavily asked by everyone in the in the market. Big companies have adopted 26,000. They have continually adopted 31,000 on risk. Uh, 22,000 on food safety, uh, you name it, you have it. So, so standards are part of the solution of the crisis and, and are certainly uh, well adopted by big groups. The big problems we have at ISO is SMEs because a lot of SMEs think that those standards are for big companies and are not, and are not connected to their business. So, so a lot of effort in the standardization market is to package 
those kind of services so SMEs can, can adopt it as well. But that answer, part of your question, um, and, and the crisis has increased the demand for, for standards and transparency and accountability and, and, and all the, the standards that can create trust. Thank you. Who would like to answer the question on the, the line manager? Jan, okay. are you? Well, I think it's, it's very important to, you have to consider this to be uh, similar to change management. You know, when you, when you change, let's say you want to change your, your way of producing certain of your, some of your products, or you, you want to uh, rationalize certain um, ways of doing things within your company, it's very similar here. It's change management, and, uh, and that means I think there's a lot, a lot of communication involved, and um, it's a never-ending process of communication. And um, it, persuasion and uh, motivation and uh, uh, all these factors are so important. Certainly, uh, ISO may be helpful, but uh, I think everyone has to be persuaded. We, we are actually certified in, in a part of our production companies uh, by ISO as well, and everyone has to be also here persuaded that it is an important part of, uh, it's important for the company and important for everyone who participates, that there's an advantage for all of us. Um, and it's very similar here. It's uh, all about change management. Very, very briefly, because yeah. we know most. One more point. I think that what is the most difficult is that when you talk about value, um, you have at one point to touch the heart so that they really understand what what is it? That's one thing. And if we look uh, in the future, maybe we won't have this discussion because the Y generation, the young generation, they, in any case, they, they want to, to work for a company that they share the personal value. So all the young generation that will come, they will go and they will work for companies that they feel that the value is the same. And this is, this is coming very, very strong in, in, what, we, and in what we see. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, we will ha Ooh. <laughs> Where are the organizers? <laughs> one point, one point. Um, equipping, equipping, equipping. Tools. Sorry, you know how to manage supply? Well, I have some doubts today with what we heard from uh, Robin, of course. But we have processes and management tools to run normal departments and businesses. These issues deserve modern tools. So they are not produced by schools. Don't expect that. So practitioners need to work with practitioners to develop them. That's one. Two, evaluation and remuneration systems. Look at the companies who are successful. Some of them have it up to 40% as KPIs in these systems. That's telling something, I think, for the middle management. And last but not least, invest in schools. Take time. because. Otherwise, you will have to brainwash them again because they are still taught the pure shareholder model, despite some very, very, very good initiatives. Thank you very much uh, for all of your, uh, your participation. Um, we, we started off with uh, the depression of, uh, of the morning, but we ended with the hope. And the biggest hope, I think, is that CSR doesn't need to exist in future as something it will just be part of business. You now have a 10-minute break. Uh, be back here in 10 minutes for the, for the next session, so just stretch your legs. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you.